If it means surviving the end of the world, Nightcrawler is going to have to work against the clock and turn some of the mutant's most hated enemies into friends. What'll happen next? Well, let's hop into the pages of Immortal X-Men issue number 7 and find out together, shall we? Yes, that's right everyone, one final Judgment Day tie-in to go. As we join the story proper, an emergency meeting of the Quiet Council is taking place not long after Magneto's death, sacrificing himself to defeat Uranus. Xavier and everyone else is at a total loss about what to do next, though they do float the idea that potentially they could resurrect Magneto, they just don't want to because it would be going against his personal wishes. Mr. Sinister, being Mr. Sinister, of course, has much less tack and says, hey, if it means defeating the Celestial and saving mutant kind, they should clone an entire football team's worth of Magneto and throw them at their enemies. But of course, this story isn't about Magneto or Mr. Sinister or the Council, it's about Nightcrawler and Immortal X-Man. Everyone gets a focused issue, and this one is all about Kurt. Which is weird because he's like the team leader POV character over in the Legion of X book, but yet that tie-in story was about Legion. Either way, Nightcrawler figures destiny with her amazing future side probably knows way more about what's going on with the Celestial Threat and how they might be able to get out of it. To make her share with the rest of the class, though, he just has to give her a nudge in the right direction. He teleports her up really high and then lets her fall, which is actually the second time he's pulled this trick. He did it to Eska, too. Irene confides in Kurt that she's scared, scared of death, scared of the end, scared that they might not make it out of this, and Nightcrawler, being such a good dude, is able to pep talk her back into helping. What is their plan? Well, it's a dangerous one that's going to see them be breaking a lot of the preconceived rules of Krakoa, and first things first, though, they're going to have to get Captain America on their side. Kirk finds Steve in the park that he's been hanging out in in the main Judgment Day book, and when he goes to talk to him, he ends up walking over a bunch of Orchis anti-mutant literature. Yes, this giant world-spanning mutant-hating force is still using the end of the world to try and recruit people to their side. Even though you would figure that the promise of mutually assured destruction of everyone on the planet would maybe make them rethink their own bigotry, but more on this in a minute. Nightcrawler ends up bamfing Captain America to his own meeting with the Celestial, which we know full well he didn't end up making it back from, but along the way, Kurt borrows some of Steve's DNA. Much like in the main Judgment Day book, it's left a little open-ended whether or not Steve actually knew what he was signing up for when it came to being the first human resurrected by the Five. Then, of course, there's the matter of Krakoa itself. If you read the main Judgment Day book, you know it, along with just about everything else in the world, got absolutely glassed by the Celestial. Xavier and Hope actually ask for volunteers amongst the citizenry of Krakoa, who's going to stay behind and make the island look populated enough, so that the Celestial can't tell that mutant kind is trying to pull a fast one on it, and you know what? Everyone asked ends up putting up their hand, willing to sacrifice themselves for the betterment of the island. Hope, of course, swearing up and down that everyone who died on the island she would make it her personal mission to be sure that they would be resurrected. Even Egg himself is forced to stay behind. To help better sell the ruse, again, he's probably the least important member of the five, so long as they have enough eggs, they can let him die. And eggs is absolutely what they need for the third and final part of Nightcrawler's big plan. Obviously, Captain America himself was resurrected in a major watershed moment for this story. But what we didn't see, though, is what the X-Men did with the other eggs that they brought to the old Avengers mansion. You see, Kurt had actually put those aside for himself because he planned to teleport into Orchis's space station to try and recruit Moira and Nimrod into protecting the machine that is Earth. Only because this is Orchis they're dealing with, they operate under a very shoot-first and ask-questions-never sort of protocol. We learn that Nightcrawler actually died several times just trying to get close enough to Moira, only here's the twist, though, unlike all those other X-Men deaths we've seen before where Cerebro backs you up, instead, this time, Xavier was actively uploading and downloading Kirk's mind into new bodies in real time, meaning that Nightcrawler actually remembered his deaths. Which is, of course, not good for the body, the mind, or the soul. Even Exodus himself had to think, wow, what an amazing martyr Kurt ultimately was. But that's just how dedicated Nightcrawler was to his friends, his family, and his new home. He was willing to suffer if it meant they could get Orchis on their side. And obviously, if you read the final Judgment Day issue, you would know this team-up didn't last forever. In fact, it barely lasted more than a few hours, but it was very important to ultimately defending the machine that is Earth and saving all of humankind.
humankind. And it's on that note right there, the comic comes to an end, everyone. And so that was Immortal X-Men issue number seven. Yet another tie into Judgment Day, while you didn't necessarily need to read it to understand the bigger event, Kieran Gillen does ultimately go out of his way to answer several very important questions that I'm sure fans like myself were asking, mainly how exactly did Orchis know to come to back everyone up at the 11th hour? How did the mutants get Captain America's DNA to resurrect him? And perhaps most importantly of all, if Mr. Sinister was able to tap into the same power that Moira was using to live lives over and over again, why didn't he use that to his advantage against the Celestial? The answer is, well, he couldn't, because apparently the end of the world is just too much information to be backed up in this case. This issue does suffer much in the same way the Sebastian Shaw issue suffered. These are supposed to be focus pieces on the different members of the Quiet Council. But sadly, a lot of their personal drama and growth ends up getting kind of muddled in the much bigger event storyline. Heck, if anything, this Nightcrawler story might actually be more disappointing in that regard, because if you want a really good, solid character piece on Kurt, all you gotta do is go and read the Legion of X book. I do wonder if they are going to pick up on the storyline now that they've written it that Kurt has remembered dying more times than anyone else and what that could possibly do to him, but it also feels like something that could easily be forgotten and thrown by the wayside, even though I hope it doesn't. Overall, I'd end up giving this one a 6.5 out of 10. Again, nothing particularly wrong with it, but also nothing all that earth-shattering or important that I would recommend. Personally, I'll be much happier when Immortal X-Men can return to its regularly scheduled programming. Hey there everyone, it's your old pal Cave Jewel, and if you're seeing me right now, that means you watched to the end of the video, which I am very appreciative of. It really helps drive engagement and retention and all that other good YouTube stuff. So does liking and commenting. Wink, wink. If you like my content too, you should check out my Patreon page. We just redid all the tiers, so there's a ton of great rewards. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, and well, it would just really help me out. It's never expected, but always appreciated. So until next time, everyone, I've been Cape Joel, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.